The dark future of cyberpunk is a grim place. Although the neon skyline of Night City may betray a sense of optimistic neo-futurism, at least at first, it doesn't take long to realize that the world of cyberpunk is much better one explored in fiction, rather than one which many of us would likely wish to find ourselves actually living in. Indeed, Night City is a place where the intrigue of cybernetic technologies is largely recognized, even by its inhabitants, as a menial if not prevalent facade draped over a cold, corporately sponsored core, which is fitting since the cyberpunk genre as a whole is recognizable in part for these thematic elements, elements which riff on or otherwise address the notion of hyper-consumerism and the ramifications of the sustained 21st century corporate mindset. Of course, it would be disingenuous to say that corporations are the sole proprietors of trouble and hardship in this futuristic hellscape, though it would perhaps be more of a falsehood not to recognize their place in it at all. And if you've been watching this channel for a while, then chances are you are already get it. These are common themes to examine within my cyberpunk lore videos, but nevertheless I believe that retreading this concept is particularly poignant for this upload specifically. If corporations are the backbone of wrongdoing in Night City, then Arasaka can be, in no uncertain terms, the most paramount antagonistic force at play in this world, and being among the largest and most profitable megacorporations certainly doesn't do them any favors. Actively engaged in all manner of crime, both white color and otherwise, Arasaka is as much a dealer in goods and services as they are a syndicate of the criminal underworld, and thus they've earned the paramount position in the minds of cyberpunk fans as the very worst corporation of them all. But what is Arasaka? Who is the prestigious family behind it, and how far back does the history of cyberpunk's most notable megacorp actually go? Finally, how did we get to where we are by the year 2077? Well, in this video, we'll discuss the full lore and history of the Arasaka Corporation, the capitalistic scourge on the world of cyberpunk. The year was 1859. The place? Tokyo, Japan. Somewhere in the city, a wealthy mother and father, descendants of the proud lineage of the samurai, gave birth to a baby boy. His name? Sasai Arasaka. Very little of Sasai's early life is known. No indication of friends or family exist, as does similarly little regarding his interests as a child. It's pretty likely that the Arasaka family compound existed prior to Sasai's birth, perhaps the place where he was raised, though it probably wasn't in the same heavily fortified state as it would be later in time. But what is known for sure, though, is that Sasai would serve in the Japanese imperial military for what seems a considerable amount of his early life. He worked his way up to the rank of captain before retiring from the service and becoming a salaryman. Evidently, Sasai was one who excelled at climbing ranks, for just as he had in the army, the man would ascend the corporate ladder too, eventually becoming a shrewd, industrially focused investor slash businessman. By the 1900s, around the age of 40, he met a woman named Yui, eight years his junior, and married her in 1905. The two would live together in the Arasaka family compound for many years, up to and through the First World War. As the conflict began in 1914, Sasai's business-mindedness would lead to an idea. He already had considerable experience with war and war machines, but also, perhaps more importantly, he was skilled with business, and knowledge in the world of manufacturing. Sasai knew that by leveraging these skills, he could turn that knowledge into fortune, and this was exactly what he did. The Arasaka company was formed in 1915, just one year after the start of World War I, and saw some amount of success manufacturing military equipment. After the conclusion of the war, the Arasaka family was no doubt sitting pretty, having amassed some capacity of wealth, though the company was only in its infancy at the time. With the war over though, Sasai and Yui would make time to start a family. Born in 1919, Saburo Arasaka was the couple's only son, and was imparted with the knowledge and discipline of his family's samurai roots early on. So much so that 20 years later, when Japan would enter World War II in 1940, Saburo himself would carry on the tradition of his father and join the armed forces. He flew as a pilot in the Imperial Japanese Navy, and like Sasai, Saburo would rather quickly rise through the ranks. However, his time in the service would end in a pretty unsavory way, in an event that would haunt Saburo for the rest of his life. 
In the first book in the Cyberpunk 2020 Corporation Report series, we get a better picture of just what went down. In 1942, over Guadalcanal, American Grumman F-4F fighters engaged a flight of Japanese Betty bombers out of Rabaul Island. The Zero fighters escorting the Bettys broke out of formation to engage the attackers, and a pitched air battle followed. One of the Zero pilots was Lieutenant Saburo Arasaka, the 23-year-old scion of a wealthy family descended from samurai lines. Despite his young age, Arasaka was a respected pilot and ace, with over 20 confirmed kills to his name. He fought with the spirit and dedication of his samurai ancestors, driven by fierce pride in his country and undying loyalty to his emperor. Unfortunately, that day was to be the last of Arasaka's career as a pilot and soldier. While the young lieutenant was weaving in pursuit of one of the F-4F Wildcat fighters, aiming for his second kill of the day, he passed through another American plane's line of fire. Saburo was wasn't vulnerable long enough to be shot down, but several bullets smashed through the canopy, shattering his left arm and driving splinters of perspex and metal into his left eye and skull. Barely conscious, he let the fighter plummet towards the ground, 15,000 feet below. Precious seconds later, Saburo struggled back to awareness, only to see the ground rushing towards him. Despite the punishing pain and the loss of the use of one arm, he pulled back on the stick, leveled his plane, and regained control with only a scant 2,000 feet to spare. Then, patching himself up as best he could, he began the long haul back to Rabaul, fully believing that he would die somewhere over the 560 miles of ocean he had to cross. Though he had to fight the excruciating agony and encroaching unconsciousness all the way back, he did not die over the ocean, nor did he crash while landing. Only after delivering his report to the base commander at Rabaul did he allow himself to pass out and be taken to the hospital. He was back in Tokyo before he regained consciousness. In Tokyo Hospital, the worst blow fell. Saburo was told that he was permanently blind in his left eye, and that his left arm, although not amputated, was damaged beyond use. He would never fly again. He was summarily discharged from service and returned to the Arasaka family compound outside of Tokyo. He spent his days brooding over his loss, wishing that that he had died in the skies and been prevented the humiliation of crippled survival. To make matters worse for the Arasakas, the war was beginning to draw to a close, and it seemed with every passing day, Japan's ability to make a comeback diminished further and further. During the conflict's height, Sasai had taken full advantage just as he had two decades prior, supplying the military with equipment. But being the remarkable market strategist that he was, Sasai understood that the defeat of Japan was all but inevitable, and thus he had the good sense to diversify his now considerable holdings, investing overseas and around the world. To this end, his company, and by extension his family, maintained their wealth in the years following the close of the Second World War. The business would survive intact, though not so Saburo's dignity. In fact, he became quite distraught over what he saw as a failure of Bushido, the moral code upheld by the samurai. This would be the lowest point of Saburo's life by far. In fact, he came close to committing seppuku in the Arasaka compound, but during his darkest moment, he had what can only be described as an epiphany. Although Japan's economy and industry were in ruins, Saburo saw a future where Japan would be strong again, not militarily, but commercially. The country would be a blank slate, waiting for the person with the correct resources to redraw it in a new image. His father, Sasai Arasaka, was a shrewd man, who had foreseen the downfall of Japan at the end of the war. Sasai had capitalized on wartime industry, but against Saburo's impassioned urging, he had made sure that the bulk of the Arasaka fortune was covertly protected in concealed overseas assets and accounts. Now, in the cherry grove, Saburo saw the wisdom of his father's actions. As family scion, that fortune would soon be his to control, a fortune that, if wielded correctly, would permit a clever man to push Japan back towards a position of power from which it could dominate the world politically and economically. The children of Amaterasu would prevail, if not under the emperor, then under another deity commerce. Saburo drew the half-inch of dagger that had penetrated his abdominal muscles before the vision had stayed his hand, and returned to the household. That night, he began the studies of politics, economics, and history that continued until his father's death in 1960. At the age of 101, Sasai would pass away, leaving to his son the fortune he'd built. 
After taking over Sasai's position as CEO, Saburo created a number of divisions and offshoots from the mainline manufacturing aspects of the Arasaka company. From here, Arasaka's investments in banking began, as did the Arasaka Security Division, which perfectly encompassed the new direction for the company, as in coming years, Arasaka Security would become the primary facet of the business. It was under Saburo's control that Arasaka would come to exhibit some of its more unsavory tendencies, though. Indeed, both the banking and security divisions were formed to cover for illicit dealings and activities, all of which served to aid the vision to restore honor to Japan by any means necessary. Saburo's security division focused as much on acts of espionage and allegedly even corporate-sponsored hit jobs than actual physical security, and moving forward, these types of operations would only grow into the norm. The banking division, on the other hand, served as a convenient vehicle for money laundering schemes. Three years after the death of Sasai, whose company had at this point thoroughly been bastardized beyond his initial intent, Yui, Saburo's mother, would also pass away at the age of 96. As a result of Saburo's diligence to move the Arasaka Corporation forward, it wouldn't be until 1980 that he had any children of his own. At this time, he met his first wife, Naomi, and soon they would give birth to their son, Kei Arasaka, whom Saburo would raise with the sole intent of passing on the company in the event of his death, or when he became too old to maintain his CEO standing. At the time, there weren't as many options for extending the lifespan of the elite, after all, a field which Arasaka was themselves yet to partake in. Sometime after Kei's birth, though, Naomi would pass away prematurely, and it's rumored that Saburo would soon marry again, this time to a woman named Ayako, who would also die of unknown circumstances in the coming decades. The 90s would be a tumultuous time in the world of cyberpunk, and caught between the death throes of the Soviet Union in 1989, the formation of parties like the EEC and the Gang of Four, as well as the rather rapid advancements in areas such as space travel and motor fuels, Arasaka would do what it does best and capitalize on all the excitement. Any good cyberpunk lore enthusiast will know, however, that the 90s were also a time of great economic recession all around the world, and channeling the wisdom of his father, Saburo would also foresee this, and made preparations to position the company for success even in the tumultuous market that was yet to arise. When the global stock market crash of 1994 occurred, Arasaka not only survived, but continued to profit off of the loss of their competitors and from the panic of everyday people. The subsequent collapse, an event in which the US government lost control of the states only two years later, held the same advantages. And if you're wondering exactly how profitable all of this growth actually proved to be for the corp, well, I'll let this clip from the documentary Saburo Arasaka, A Giant's Life, found in Cyberpunk 2077, speak for itself. It was in 1990 when Arasaka Corp first emerged on the global 500 list. Then in 1996, after the collapse of the United States, it rose to number two in the rankings. Never one to settle, though, much of Saburo's energy in the 90s was dedicated towards what I can only describe as finessing the Japanese government. Corporate lobbying in Japanese affairs became commonplace for Arasaka at the time, which put a sour taste in the mouths of many other Japanese businesses. These parties would soon band together to form the Far Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere, or FAX, which ran as both a publicly traded company and its own pseudo-megacorporate political affiliate. The main prerogative of this group was essentially to stop Arasaka's own mega-corporate practices from penetrating the Japanese government further, and for the most part, this actually would work. Though, Saburo was nevertheless able to accomplish some things during his first big stint into politics. For starters, he elevated the Defense Agency of Japan into the Ministry of Defense, and sought to depower the Japanese civilian police, which would, in turn, likely provide clients for Arasaka's security's new paramilitary program while simultaneously undermining Arasaka's direct competitors. With all the corporate history to keep up with in this brief decade, let us not forget that the 90s was also the time when Saburo married his third and final partner, Michiko Arasaka. They would have two children together, Yorinobu in 1995, and later Hanako in 1999. Shortly after the birth of her daughter, though, Michiko would pass away due to complications from pregnancy thus finalizing the oddly coincidental set of circumstances which led to all three of Saburo's wives suffering premature deaths. It's no secret that throughout her life, Hanako would be Saburo's favorite child. He was protective over her in a way that simply couldn't be said for either of his two sons. 
and while Yorinobu would grow up attending top schools in Tokyo, Hanako would be cloistered away within the Arasaka family compound, and homeschooled only by people whom Saburo personally trusted. During the beginning of the 2000s, it's said that Saburo himself gained a rather favorable reputation. Overseas, Arasaka's European headquarters would also be established, which, combined with the corpse's sustained U.S. presence, extended that jovial reputation as Arasaka provided thousands around the globe with stable work. In the midst of a time post-collapse where stable anything was not really easy to come by. At the most trying time in our history, Saburo Arasaka provided thousands of Americans with reliable work and helped us regain a sense of our former prosperity. For that, we will always owe him a debt of gratitude. Arigato gozaimasu, Saburo-san. Saburo himself would also begin having cybernetic augmentations done in a bid to repair or replace his body parts which were damaged during his time as a fighter pilot. As the technology was now beginning to advance to a point where cybernetics were becoming a viable non-experimental option, at least for the elite. The Arasaka company as a whole was also developing an increased interest in cybernetic technologies, specifically in some of the more fringe areas, such as full Borg conversions. In particular, they gained the trust of a young man from New York, whose body was utterly destroyed and who was on the brink of death after being struck with two RPGA warheads in New York City. Arasaka would offer this young man a deal and finance a full Borg conversion body for him if he agreed to join the ranks of Arasaka security. That boy Boy, named Adam Smasher would agree, and soon he would go on to become one of Arasaka's most recognizable and prolific security assets, at the same time exemplifying the corporation's recent tendencies toward an increasing level of violence in their operations. Borg conversions and cybernetics wouldn't be the only forays Arasaka took into smaller markets during the 2000s, however, one example being when in 2008 they were hired by the government of Taiwan to coordinate protection against a suspected invasion from mainland China. It was here that a rivalry of sorts would be born. You see, the Chinese Communist Party had subcontracted a corporation of their own to aid in the siege of the Taiwanese islands. Not just any corp either. Who else but Militech International Armaments, established a mere decade prior in 1996. This event, which directly pitted the two megacorps against one another for perhaps the first time, would almost certainly initiate the infamous Arasaka vs. Militech tension, which would inevitably lead to a lot of the events in the Fourth Corporate War. But we'll get to that eventually. At this point, the first corporate war between Euro business machines and Orbital Air had only come to a close two years prior, so while the precedent was set, it likely wasn't on the agenda of either party. Meanwhile, Kei Arasaka would father his first and only child. She would be named Michiko after the name of Kei's own late grandmother. Three years later, in 2010, Arasaka would partner with Euro Business Machines, along with fellow corporations WorldSat, World News Service, and the notorious Triad Organized Crime Syndicate, to repel yet another invasion from mainland China, this time of Hong Kong. In 2013, each of the four corporations gained control over large swaths of the area. Arasaka in particular did as Arasaka does, and erected a regional office on the lands that they now controlled. Sadly, it would also be around this time in 2010 when Saburo Arasaka would suffer a stroke that would leave him confined to a wheelchair up through the 2020s. Next, an innovative new product would soon release from a partnership between the Megacorp and the Sony Corporation. Yes, I promise this is canon, and you know what, I'm not even going to tell you what the product is just yet. Instead, I'm going to describe it to you, and I want you to have a guess, alright? Here we go. This thing, called the Sony Arasaka Medusa 2000, featured a multi-medium zoom lens with image enhancers, telescopic macro zoom abilities, anti-dazzle, UV and thermograph sensors, and all of this tech delivered to the user by way of the emerging technology of neural processing. This data could be recorded as well, either in a neural processing storage bank or onto separate external data chips. I imagine that you probably haven't guessed what it is yet, and that's okay, because those words probably don't mean that much to a lot of us. Well, let me tell you about the best part, alright? The Medusa was packaged alongside a silenced 10mm caseless SMG with a 40-shot clip and adjustable folding stock. So yeah, Sony helped produce a neural interfacing firearm scope in the cyberpunk universe. In an alternate timeline, maybe this canonically hard-to-find product was basically the Dark Futures version of the PlayStation 
PlayStation 5 shortage. The next events on Arasaka's menu, though, wouldn't be nearly as funny. And in fact, I would say it's probably one of Arasaka's worst deeds to date. In 2013, Saburo would first be made aware of a particular figure, a woman by the name of Alt Cunningham. Alt was a prolific and talented netrunner, who explored the web along with figures such as Spider Murphy and the legendary Raish Barkmoss. But she's perhaps best known for being credited as the inventor of an at the time unnamed program, a system which possessed the capability to recreate an engram of one's consciousness within code. Though this project was initially undertaken at the request of the company ITS, Arasaka understood the gravity and promise such a program could offer its users, and so it was decided that procurement of the program was of the utmost importance to them. To this end, Saburo contacted the CEO of Arasaka's American division, Toshiro. Hikaru, and ordered the apprehension of Alt, so that a replica program could be compiled. If Johnny Silverhand's memories from Cyberpunk 2077 are to be believed, which is a debate in and of itself, I fear, we have a pretty good idea of what happened from here. Alt was apparently abducted by hired thugs, and passed over to Arasaka, where she would be detained against her will and made to recreate the program. Yet, she was smart enough to understand that Arasaka was likely to test her creation on her themselves, so she incorporated a contingency into the design, which would allow her consciousness to escape into the net if this happened. Meanwhile, Johnny Silverhand, who witnessed Alt's kidnapping, teamed up with Rogue Amendieres, the nomadic Santiago, and a media named Lyle Thompson to formulate and enact a plan in order to retrieve her. The group would organize a live performance from Silverhand's band, Samurai, just outside of Night City's Arasaka Tower. This led to rioting, which provided the four instigators an opportunity to breach the building, where they confronted and killed Toshiro before trying in vain to bring Alt back to flesh. I would advise you not to disturb her. What'd you do to Alt? I put her to work on a project of a lifetime. Get out of my way. Alt. Is she? Alt, come on, don't do this. Though Johnny's memories in Cyberpunk 2077 don't appear to be 100% reliable based on discrepancies between some orders of events in other areas of canon, one thing is for certain. The program Alt had created would come to be known as Soul Killer. Arasaka wants her. Abduction was a standard intercorp extraction. Nothing more. Okay, so what are they after? Soul Killer, an AI. Sound familiar at all? Of course. Urban legend with the shittiest name ever. It's no legend. Soul Killer's real. And your Chumbas at Arasaka just hired the runner who wrote it. Take that in. Saka with Soul Killer to do with as it pleases. Grim, my man. Obviously, with the Soul Killer tech in hand, Arasaka would almost immediately begin the process of iteration, a process which would continue right up through 2077. And in the coming years, we'll see Soul Killer go through several noticeable forms, one of which being the Soul Killer 2.5 program, which was prevalent at the time of the Fourth Corporate War. Meanwhile, the rioting and subsequent killing of Arasaka America's CEO would go on to be recognized as an act of terror. With Toshiro out of the picture, it was decided that Kei Arasaka would finally take the reins of a branch within the company, for Kei had lately been relieving his father of many corporate duties, and for the next 10 years or so, this was how things would proceed. Then, in 2016, Arasaka would experience a bit of a roadblock on their warpath to success, budding from a talk Sabara would have with Yorinobu. The day after 21-year-old Yorinobu Arasaka graduated from Todai, Saburo brought him to his private chambers at the compound. There, he explained to his youngest son the true nature of the Arasaka Corporation. Rather than agreeing with his father's vision, as Kei had, Yorinobu was secretly appalled. That night, after a celebratory dinner given in his honor, Yorinobu slipped out of the compound and vanished into the Tokyo night. After this, the next four years would consist of Yorinobu building up a sort of gang with whom to oppose Arasaka's forces, and so jumping to 2020, we can see the fruits of this labor coming to fruition. Now four years later, Yorinobu has gathered about him a cadre of tough Tokyo nomads, Kotetsu no Ryu, the Steel Dragons. 
Together, they have sworn to expose and destroy Arasaka. At night, they prowl the canyons of the city, harassing Arasaka men and unearthing information on Arasaka black operations. Yorinobu's knowledge of Arasaka facilities and corporate procedures gives the Steel Dragons some advantages, but they still lack the power or information to make serious headway against the corporation. Yorinobu is, however, able to tread the world of the street and the corporate tower with equal facility. When he is not riding with his men, he is traveling the world, meeting with other enemies of Arasaka, looking for funds and equipment. Slowly but surely, his operation is growing. Saburo is greatly saddened by his youngest son's disloyalty and acknowledges that Yorinobu must be destroyed. Kei, who hates Yorinobu for his defection, has sworn to kill his half-brother. Hanako, on the other hand, still loves her brother. Yorinobu was Saburo's only other child by Michiko, and he has always felt a special bond with his sister. Although Hanako is unaware of it, he has sworn Sworn to free her from her father's clutches. Once a month, Yorinobu and Hanako secretly communicate through the net, reaffirming their fraternal love for one another. Despite their relative success in harassing Arasaka, much of the Steel Dragon's gang would fall not long afterwards, due to information collected from interrogated members of the gang in Night City, which allowed for regional hubs of Arasaka around the world to seek out and destroy pockets of local Steel Dragon activity. Nevertheless, Yorinobu would persist in his campaign to damage the company one way or another. By this time in 2020, Saburo was relegated to a wheelchair, his body having reached the limit limit of biotic and cybernetic enhancements possible at the time, though we know that by 2077 some advancements must have occurred which allowed him to walk once again. He also had a provision prepared that utilized Alt's Soul Killer program that would wait on standby for many years, prepared to, in the event of Saburo's death, engage to create a copy of his consciousness in his last moments, thus ensuring that the man's engram would live on in company databases for years to come. In the meantime, K would have by now become the official CEO of the Corp, though Saburo would of course continue to oversee operations from the comfort of the family compound. Business dealings during this year include Arasaka weaseling its way into a position of political power within Portugal after a tense struggle for power between the two rising candidates in the region. The Corp also managed to lose a cargo submarine in the North Pacific, which led to the acquisition of an entire company known as International Defense Alliance specifically to oversee the craft's retrieval, which was apparently ferrying important Arasaka assets and information, known only to be associated with the mysterious Project 5, which was an explosive chemical compound being developed by the Corp at the time. All of this information regarding the sub, the acquisition of IDA, Project 5, and more comes from the Bonin Horse Adventure book, which I haven't heard or seen a whole lot of conversation about online, and it's a shame, because this thing's actually pretty neat. Yes, indeed, the story does involve a giant squid, and yeah, just a little side note, I highly recommend that those of you watching go ahead and give it a read, it's pretty fun. In 2021, things were about to get ugly, though at this point small skirmishes and espionage efforts were common fare for Arasaka, this year would mark the beginning of the Fourth Corporate War, a multi-year-long conflict stemming from the Corps Sino and Otec, both of whom sought control over the assets of the defunct IHAG Corporation. In order to assert their respective interest, both corps got aggressive rather fast, and subcontracted other firms to defend against suspected attacks from one another. Otec was first to the punch, and hired the American security and weapons firm Militech prompting Sino to respond by calling on none other than Arasaka. Now, one might think that at this point, the old wounds from a battle in Taiwan 15 years prior would have been quickly remembered and rehashed, but this isn't exactly the case. At least at first, the war was little more than a platform from which Arasaka and Militech could respectively generate profit while also demonstrating the might of their security forces. Neither corp had a real interest in overt, sustained warfare, as this type of fighting simply wasn't going to be profitable in the long term. However, there were still a series of factors that would escalate the situation into a full-on grudge match, one which would eventually overshadow the initial battle between Sino and 
OTEC entirely, with the two companies actually pivoting to de-escalate the tension between their hired help on January 19th, 2022. Of course, for the Arasaka family though, the fighting also took on a much more personal tone. For Saburo in particular, embarrassing and defeating Militech on the world stage fit quite well ideologically into his overall plan and wish to bring glory to Japan, sort of like a spiritual retribution for the events of World War II, I guess. By February of 2022, world governments began to intervene, seizing assets from Sino, OTEC and IHAG respectively. As a result of these seizures the world over, the two instigating companies largely withdrew from the war they'd started, forced into negotiations by the powers that be. Though for Arasaka and Militech, the conflict had already become personal, and so, by their own volition, all-out war would be waged. Next, Rach Bartmoss's data crash would obfuscate nearly 80% of the internet, and having foreseen that net infrastructure was subject to attack, Saburo and his associates would compile large amounts of information from the net in a database underneath Arasaka Tower in Night City. This database would be called the Arasaka Secure Database, and would be completed sometime prior to 2023. We know this because it would go on to become the subject of one of the most pivotal events in cyberpunk history. It wouldn't be long before August 20th, 2023 the day which would go down in infamy for the bombing on Arasaka Tower. During this event, a Militech-sponsored party, headed by Morgan Blackhand and Johnny Silverhand, would launch an assault on Arasaka's Night City headquarters in order to access or destroy that Arasaka secret database from earlier. This wasn't all that the team was to accomplish, however, as they had also been supplied with a nuclear device which was to be planted inside the building to ensure the complete destruction of Arasaka assets, including the database in question. While Arasaka Tower would be defended steadfastly by Adam Smasher, among others, the operation would result in disaster for the Megacorp when the device was detonated and Arasaka Tower would come crumbling down. In 2077, V can even visit a memorial site for this disastrous day. In this spot, in 2023, an explosion from a terrorist attack on the first Arasaka Tower claimed the lives of more than 12,000 victims. May they rest in peace. Speaking of Cyberpunk 2077, we're led to believe that Johnny Silverhand was captured by Adam Smasher and presented to Saburo after the blast, and once again, whether this actually happened or was a result of tampering with Johnny's engram is unclear. However, there can be no doubt that regardless of if things happened like this, or if they align more closely with the Fall of the Tower storyline from the Cyberpunk Red Core book, as I speculated in my Adam Smasher video, Johnny was certainly still soul-killed one way or another, and his engram taken hostage. I'm not really going to get into the specifics of what happened during this event much further than that, but either way that should be enough context for this video's purposes. As one may imagine, the bombing of the tower was a major hit to the Arasaka company, but also for the whole of the fourth corporate war moving forward. The detonation of a nuke in a heavily populated area was more than enough to get the new United States government involved who, nearing the end of the war, engaged in a massive PR campaign to blame Arasaka for the bombing of their own tower, and then worked to kick them out of the country entirely. Notice how unfair and backwards this actually is, too. Despite Arasaka being the victims of the bombing rather than the instigators, they were the ones forced out of the country, while Militech was left to more or less do whatever they wanted. I imagine that NUSA president Elizabeth Kress, who herself was a former president of Militech, probably has something to do with this. To be completely fair and transparent, Militech did end up having their assets nationalized in the US, but either way, it's sort of a small price to pay compared to the part that they played in instigating one of cyberpunk's greatest tragedies of all time. It's just one of those scenarios where the punishment didn't really fit the crime. Cress definitely went pretty easy on them. With multitudinous impending financial seizures on the horizon, Saburo was beginning to see the writing on the wall. But it would actually be an act from his son, Yorinobu, that would cost Arasaka the war. Behind his father's back, Yorinobu had been working to nationalize Arasaka with the Japanese government, thus delivering a devastating blow to their potential for growth, as business would now be relegated to Japan and Japan alone. This would cut off Arasaka from each and every international branch, and the assets associated with them. Simultaneously, this would extend the rift between Saburo and Yorinobu to a degree 
that hasn't been seen before or since. And in fact, it wouldn't be until the death of Saburo's oldest son that the relationship with his youngest could be repaired. After the bombing on Arasaka Tower in Night City, K would take refuge in a company-controlled submarine, while reeling from all of the seizures of Arasaka assets and contemplating his next move. But as described in the final pages of Firestorm Shockwave, K would awake to find his staff and guards incapacitated, and none other than Spider Murphy sitting in his dining chambers. Here, Murphy would appeal to K's familial samurai roots, and convinced him that the only way to repent for the dishonor he'd brought to his name would be in committing an act of seppuku, not by way of the sword, but by allowing himself to be soul-killed by Murphy herself. I'll read a part of that interaction now. Spider pours the sake with a steady hand. She passes a cup over to K, who takes it with a steady hand. They drink. He nods to the computer link, and the cable that is coiled next to it. You would have me execute myself. I could force you, but I have no wish to. It is inevitable. It is the only honorable thing for you to do. Think of it as seppuku. You are samurai, are you not? Her words are honed blades, slicing away the shields he had built in his mind. His attempt to deny his failure, the utter totality of his clan's collapse, his part in all of it as first son, his karma. As ruthless as he is, he is still samurai. You are not my first choice of a Kaisha Kunin, but, he says, Spider nods. He nods back, and solemnly jacks in. As the soul killer rushes upon him, he speaks through the interface. The ocean waves swell, stare into death's eyes laughing, the seagulls cry above. Spider watches as the twitching subsides, then ceases. Five long minutes later, she kneels by him, checking the pulse of her victim. She shakes her head and mentally sends a brief flurry of commands. The inner link on the table begins to smoke, as the last Soul Killer system dies thousands of miles away in a fiery blast. After hearing of his son's unfortunate demise, Saburo would attend Kei's funeral, where he made amends with his remaining son, Yorinobu, with Hanako's aid. Actually, as it turns out, what was once seen as an act of betrayal by Yorinobu was recognized as actually not being all that bad. For the next decade or so, Arasaka would avoid a lot of collateral damage and scrutiny, although, admittedly, the whole affair of the Fourth Corporate War painted the country of Japan itself in a pretty poor light to the rest of the world. With time, though, wounds of pride would heal, and by 2040, the Corp had worked to regain many of the assets they had lost, still being considered one of the world's largest, most enterprising armed forces, despite their activities at least those above board, being relegated to Japan alone. The company did, however, encounter a bit of a roadblock in this pursuit, a roadblock in the form of yet another member of the family, one who we've touched on very briefly up until this point, Kei's daughter Michiko, who, at this point, had remained in the NUSA, and was going through a bit of a saga of her own trying to gain citizenship, a thread which is expanded upon in the Cyberpunk Red core book. As the Arasaka Corporation faced defeat at the hands of the US military, it was forced to pull almost all its operations back to the core Zaibatsu in Japan. The loss of the current operations chief, Kei Arasaka, eldest son of the family-owned business, threw control of the vast security firm back into the hands of the family patriarch the centenarian Saburo Arasaka. Even at his advanced age, the elder Arasaka had not lost his ability to plan strategically or to inspire both loyalty and utter terror in his subordinates. But in America, Kei's only daughter Michiko faced her own dilemma. Her family company was now hated worldwide as one of the instigators of a terrible war, as well as having a reputation for mass murder based on the accusation that they had detonated a nuclear device in the center of a major American city. Michiko, a sheltered 17-year-old high schooler, had, of course, known very little of her elder family's world-spanning machinations, and her father had made certain to keep her away from the more unsavory side of the family business. With the Arasaka Corporation now persona non grata in the Americas, Michiko faced being deported to Japan, a distant nation that, as an American born and raised teenager, was utterly alien to her. Michiko's solution was to lean heavily into her strengths. She was young, adorably cute, and possessed a high IQ. She already had thousands of devoted young fans all over the world, who were willing to take it as gospel that she was an innocent caught up in her evil family's misdeeds. She started by traveling to Washington, D.C., to meet with President Elizabeth Kress, to both apologize for her family's part in the war and to plead her case to remain an American citizen. It's not entirely known what Michiko and Kress discussed, 
but in the end, Michiko was allowed to remain in America to finish her high school career and then enter Stanford University, where she majored in, of all things, criminology. When she graduated three years later, she started her own business. Dubbed Danger Gal, Michiko's company was both a legitimate private investigation firm and a shell company funded covertly by Elizabeth Kress herself, with the intent of dismantling as many Arasaka assets as possible in the States while retaining a sort of cover. I also couldn't help but notice that the Red Core book left out the bit about Michiko dating Adam Smasher in her early years of college. And because that's such an odd and, frankly, funny tidbit of information, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned it here somewhere. So, yeah. If you don't know what I'm talking about, or you want to hear more about that and haven't done so already, watch my Adam Smasher lore video for more information. One other thing before we move on, despite the last intact Soul Killer system being destroyed by Murphy, the source code was retained, as were some aspects of the system which would be used to rebuild it again without too much trouble, hence why we see it again in 2077. Two and a half decades after the end of the Fourth Corporate War, Arasaka's internal structure was beginning to look very different to how it had in the past. By the time the year 2045 rolled around, Arasaka's management had been divided into factions, each vying for power and control with in the organization. While it's unknown exactly how many factions have risen or fallen over the three or so decades between 2045 and 2077, there are but three that have been successful in permeating the culture of Arasaka and establishing themselves as serious parties within the company. Each of the big three is headed by a member of the Arasaka family, and they go as follows. The first, and probably easiest to understand, is the Kiji, or Green Pheasant faction, led by Hanako. The reason I bring this one up first is that they're essentially vying for the company to be run the same way it always has, for the last 120 years at least, sticking with the spirit and vision of Saburo. Next is the Taka, or Hawk, faction, led by Yorinobu, which, far and away, is the most morally ambiguous of the three. There's an innate desire in this group to move away from Saburo's iron-gripped philosophy and way of doing things, but Yorinobu himself isn't perfectly altruistic either, despite what his past would have you assume. Much of the Taka's characterization is revealed through a selection of Cyberpunk 2077's endings, so we'll definitely discuss them more closely as this video continues. But for now, just know that they're a sort of chaotic neutral faction with nondescript goals aside from simply moving the company past Saburo's control. Finally, we have the Hato, or Dove faction, led by Michiko, a branch that is by far the least popular, though still respectable in size, as it appealed far less to business values, such as profit at all costs, in favor of more human sensibilities, like reform within the company. They're basically the only good guys to pretty much ever come out of Arasaka, but you almost never hear about them because of how small they are, too, so yeah. The next several years would see Arasaka regaining control in the West and producing new products, while also building up reputation in Japan itself. Probably their most prolific accomplishment in the country at this time would come in 2067, when Arasaka security forces foiled an assassination attempt on the Emperor. 2067. An Arasaka bodyguard shields the Emperor of Japan from an assassin's bullet. A year later, they produced the Kusanagi CT3X motorcycle in collaboration with the Yaiba Corporation, which was a smashing success, and during the United States Unification War in 2069 and 2070, a conflict wherein the NUSA attempted to regain control of the states, which began acting autonomously during the collapse, Arasaka would side with Night City specifically, in a bid to help them keep their sovereignty. When the rest of the free states, except Texas, signed the Treaty of Unification, Night City seceded from the Union, and declared itself a sovereign city-state, thus welcoming Arasaka back into North America, after the Corp had won the city's favor by siding with them. At this point, a new Arasaka Tower was constructed, and the Arasaka Waterfront was also created. The early 2070s would see another round of rapid-fire accomplishments and dealings, especially for Arasaka's security. 2071. Arasaka security forces prevent mass riots in San Francisco, saving the city from certain ruin. 2074. An Arasaka investigation eliminates a terror cell in Rio de Janeiro, ending a string of attacks and executing those responsible. 2076. Arasaka's counterintelligence division effectively secures a corporate summit in Jakarta, foiling 45 plots to attack and sabotage it. How will Arasaka shine in 2077? That depends on you.
Of course, 2076 also marked the year that the events of Cyberpunk Edge Runners would take place, meaning Faraday's dealings with David Martinez and his crew would go down before David would steal the experimental Arasaka cyberskeleton, and then he would confront Adam Smasher at Arasaka Tower, where Faraday himself would be killed. Finally, also in the early part of the 2070s, Anders Hellman was made the director of the Relic Project, which utilized code from Soul Killer to preserve personality constructs. This was meant to be a product that would put Soul Killer to use on the market. A year later, this item would become the focal point of the plot of Cyberpunk 2077. In the last known year of Cyberpunk canon at the time of recording, Militech would discover that Arasaka had been concealing a secret mass driver on the moon, and tipped off the ESA, which was the only organization permitted to create or control mass drivers in the first place. As such, the ESA would re-examine Arasaka's credentials, and found that the Night City branch had been the ones responsible for the mistake which led many to fear a response from oversight in Japan. Hoping to cover their tracks, Arthur Jenkins oversaw a sabotage of the ESA members, using Netrunners to violently kill the council. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just as we thought. You know what to do. Start now. This same year, the Japanese branch was also responsible for developing some new technologies, such as an electromagnetic ballistic missile and a more enduring reflex booster than that which was currently on the market. But of course, the most notable advancement was the completion of the Relic project. The biochip was first offered to customers in Tokyo, but quickly marketed to Western consumers as well a short time later. For the first time ever, the technology to preserve a consciousness after death was publicly available. The drawback, of course, being the price. The Relic biochip was very costly to obtain, and was not in any way intended for availability to the masses. It was simply a way for the most wealthy customers of Arasaka to secure their soul, just as the motto states. Of course, the Relic prototype would serve as an object of interest in a heist conducted by V and Jackie Wells, where the two would also witness the hostile killing of Saburo Arasaka himself, at the age of 158. He was of course killed by his own son, Yorinobu Arasaka, at the Kompeki Plaza Luxury Hotel. After Yorinobu was confronted for stealing the Relic prototype from Saburo, <laughs> The prototype was successfully stolen by Jackie and V, resulting in the rediscovery of the long-lost consciousness of Johnny Silverhand. The theft also led V to be tracked down after their own death by Saburo's former bodyguard, Goro Takemura. While V recovered from the heist, Takemura learned of the true nature of Saburo's death and after a conversation in Tom's diner, the two form a sort of hesitant alliance, where they would work together to get in contact with Anders Hellman, track down Evelyn Parker, and even meet with Hanako Arasaka in order to clue her into her brother's plot, albeit through a forced abduction rather than a traditional meeting. I saw Saburo Arasaka die. He wasn't poisoned. It's a lie your brother made up and spread. Yorinobu is the murderer. This particular encounter was actually interrupted by order of Yorinobu, and if V does not try and rescue Takemura from the collapsing building, he'll actually perish right here. The raid on this event actually provides us with some pretty interesting insight into Yorinobu's faction and his character though, proving a sense of complexity, or at least hypocrisy, evident within Yorinobu's ideals. Though he seems not to agree with Saburo's vision for Arasaka as a Japan-centric corporation, he's still ready to sign off on many of the same shady, underhanded dealings as his father had, even those which go against his own kin. These points are expanded upon by Hanako near the end of the game. We received a warning during the parade. Security protocols were violated. The first doubts sprouted then. They grew yet greater in your hideout, when my brother's assault group arrived not to rescue, 
but to kill. Dorinobu was just plain willing to sacrifice you. My father was right about my brother. He never cared for us. I was brought up to be the heart of the family. It is time for the Arasakas to listen to their heart. It will bring justice. At this point, it was fairly obvious that Yoronobu's Taka faction was up to something, and before long, the full extent of his plans would be made clear. Though Cyberpunk 2077 has a number of variable endings, what remains true across all of them is that Yoronobu and those loyal to him would instigate a coup, in which all major branches of Arasaka around the world were simultaneously sieged by Taka sympathizers. This whole situation can shake out in a number of ways but effectively, there are two major outcomes. In most endings to Cyberpunk 2077, Yorinobu is successful, and the Taka go on to occupy a position of near-complete power within the company, though the takeover itself costs much in the way of funding, assets, and casualties. There's even a variation of this ending where Hanako dies during the assault, though in most she simply retreats from the public eye after the decimation of the Kiji. However, if V is to assist Hanako in bringing her brother to justice as the heart of the Arasaka family, a much more disastrous set of circumstances are to play out. In this instance, the Kiji faction actually succeeds in repelling Yorinobu's onslaught, at least in Night City. It starts with the realization that Saburo's consciousness is still alive within the Mikoshi database. I guess that system put in place by the year 2020 was still operational after all. From here, Hanako and V pay a visit to the Arasaka board, where Saburo's engram easily persuades the board members to follow Hanako instead of Yorinobu. If our testimony is not enough, perhaps you will listen to my father. Uh, at this point, the takeover begins, and V must fight their way up Arasaka Tower. Instead of confronting Adam Smasher outside of the Mikoshi entrance like in every other iteration of the timeline, we instead fight him just outside of the CEO office. And after the full Borg bodyguard of Yoranobu is defeated, V makes their way into the chambers beyond. Here, they'll have a conversation with Yoranobu that may serve as the first hint that their decision to aid his sister may not have been the right one. Look. What do you see? Terror and debts that could have been avoided. Avoided? You've lost. It is they who have lost. Kyoto. Dubai. Paris. These people had a chance today, but they lost it. A chance? A chance for what? To forget their fear. This how you want to help people forget their fear? By killing them. Sorry. Just don't get it. Fear. Ever since I can remember. The one thing I cannot deny him, he knew how to cause fear in people. Saburo. He once told me anything of value is only a flag blowing in wind, and wind is fear. And then, you know what he did? Blew in my face. That was the one time he was wrong. And others? It worked on them. They feared him. Even now, you saw. Idiots terrified of a dead man talking from a box. Pathetic. I would change that. If only you did not appear. At this point, V wakes up in an Arasaka orbital station. The relic removal surgery is performed, 
and apparently is a success, but V is left empty, a part of their mind simply gone. For several days and nights, they undergo a series of tests with little to no discernible purpose before, at last, they're offered a deal. If Takemura was saved in the collapse of the Konapt apartment building, he will be the one to approach V with the offer, though in the other instance, it'll be Anders Hellman who fulfills the role. It's at this point that the final decision of the devil ending must be made. I fear I'm the bearer of bad news. Listen to me. The procedure was a success. We removed the biochip. But the damage it wrought proved enormous. At the genetic level, altered DNA. The kind you would find in those suffering from radiation sickness. And sadly, it's lethal. Arasaka Corporation has the capability to cheat death. All we require from you is a dose of trust. Trusted you once already. Fat lot of good that did me. You may join our pilot program. Secure your soul. I fear your body is no longer of any use. You must abandon it. We will create an engram of your mind and store it in Mikoshi. And if I refuse? Your belongings are packed. A shuttle will take you back to Earth, and you will be dead before winter. It's no easy decision, I know. You should think it through carefully. In all honesty, the choice here is but an illusion. By the time V has progressed to a point where they're cut between returning to Earth to wander as a broken individual, or to seal the last fleeting embers of their life within Mikoshi, there's no hope of a happy ending left. What's perhaps worst, though, is that the same sentiment seems to extend to the world at large, given the concerning news that we witness while in Arasaka care. lives once more, though now in the body of his son. The CEO was reported dead months ago, but now it's been revealed that a copy of his consciousness was made before his death. It appears his consciousness was used to override that of his son and heir Yorunobu Arasaka. This shocking development was revealed at a press conference earlier today. Several weeks tensions between Arasaka Corp and Militech escalated to troubling levels. Many pundits and analysts warned of a possible outbreak of armed conflict. The exacerbation of tensions was heightened when Yorinobu Arasaka assumed leadership following his father's death and accused Militech of his murder. However, in an unexpected shift, the return of Saburo Arasaka appears to have diffused the situation between the rival megacorporations. The future of Arasaka is left in an unclear state. Where the cyberpunk timeline can possibly go from here has never been less sure, but in no instance do I foresee a future in which Arasaka is not present. To wrap up this hour or so long examination though, let me leave you with this. Ever since Sasai founded the company in 1915, Arasaka has had an intimate relationship with the samurai-born concept of Bushido, which, while it has, like so many other things, been appropriated in popular media, is a very real term used to refer to various practices, customs, and codes employed by many different groups of samurai throughout time. In a sense, it's more of a way to refer to the act of being samurai rather than one particular code or set of rules. However, there was a core tenet in the philosophy and ideology of many samurai which has gone on to become almost synonymous with their modern interpretation. Many samurai were mortally loyal to their cause, even if that cause was recognized not to be a just one. In many ways, I think it's difficult not to see that same practice employed at Arasaka, and at other companies, both in and out of cyberpunk. Well folks, you've done it. You've made it to the end of this absurdly long video, and I want to thank you. If you're seeing this outro right now, it really does mean a lot. You've sat for probably over an hour uh, listening to me talk about cyberpunk lore, 
and uh, I really want to thank you for that. I think that's pretty cool. Not only that, though, I really hope that you guys enjoyed and maybe got something out of the video today. I would really appreciate you leaving a comment. As always, I read each and every one, and I'm always looking for input on the video topic and or what I can do to improve these types of videos in the future. I know that there were a few segments in here of wonky sound, and I apologize for that. It's inevitable that in these longer uploads, I have to go back and re-record a few things, so you know how it goes. If you really enjoyed this video, and or if it's your first time around on the channel, I'd love to see you leave a like, and if you're feeling extra generous, maybe even consider subscribing to get notified of another lore video down the road, whether it be about cyberpunk or anything else. I've got plans to cover a lot more cyberpunk lore, as well as a bunch of other different stuff coming before the end of the year. One last thing before I let you go today, if my calculations are correct, this video should be going up shortly after the beginning of August, in which case some of the more devout cyberpunk fans may recognize that there's a particular date not that far away, and I just wanted to let you guys know that I do have something kind of special prepared. Well, I say prepared, it's not done yet. Probably when this video goes up, I'll be working feverishly on that to try and get it done in time. Time. Uh, but things are going smoothly there, and if you've gotten all the way to the end of this video, then I think you're probably going to enjoy what I've got cooking up for that, too. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of let you guys know about that, too. Anyway, I won't keep you any longer. Thanks again for sticking around today. This is a Verberon. I'll see you again real soon, and have a good one.